folks, there she is, the Rube Goldberg door opener upper. Sure, sure, I know they have a gadget called an electric eye that does practically the same thing. But that's no good for a waiter. You see, the, ele the electricity might give the waiter a shock, then he'd forget to come back to pick up his tip, and he'd lose his professional standing. How does this door opener upper really work? It's very simple. But watch close. Now here's what happens. You see, waiter places cap B on pile of dirty dishes A. Now cap B sees mouse C. Of course, this is a stuffed mouse because he must be used for the next waiter. Now cap jumps on mouse C, causing lever D to lift lighted candle E, which ignites fuse F and sets off bomb G, opening door H very gently. Well, folks, I suppose there are one or two among you who think that my uh, inventions are a bit ahead of their time. A shade fantastic, perhaps. All right, go on and say it. Downright screwy. But let me tell you something. I've got lots of company, genuine inventors, guys who've got their stuff protected by the United States Patent Office. And believe me, some of it needs protection, if you know what I mean. For instance, Now, here's an invention that was granted patent number 556248 back in the year 1896. But don't ask me why. <laughs> this little nifty is a labor-saving device if there ever was one. It's an automatic hat tipper for the lazy Lothario. Fitted snugly inside of this deluxe derby, that is, <laughs> in addition to the wearer's slightly addled head, is a conglomeration of wheels, cogs, gears, ratchets, counterweights, strings, and pulleys, which gallantly doffs the chapeau whenever a young heiress passes by. Well, anyway, this is just one example of the many queer devices that have actually been patented. And here's a copy of the patent to prove it. Oh, there are literally hundreds of such patents on file in the United States Patent Office. The inventors were all perfectly serious. They really believed that their inventions would make things easier for us and our lives pleasanter and safer. But by far the most persistent dream of inventors has been to get something for nothing. That is, to create a machine that will start itself, overcome all friction, and still have enough power left to do useful work. In short, perpetual motion machines. Now here's a typical example of what I mean, a famous old standby. Of course, you all know that when something is dipped underwater, it seems to lose weight. So this particular perpetual motion machine is designed to have some of the weights in water and some of them out of water at all times. It's all very simple. And so are you if you think it'll work. But confidentially, I've got one that will work. And if you'll excuse me for a few minutes, I'll show you. No, Mr. Goldberg, not even your genius is equal to that task. In fact, the United States Patent Office will no longer grant a patent for the design of a perpetual motion machine because the experts in that office know that you can't get something for nothing. That you can't get power out of an engine without paying for it in fuel. Fortunately for us, however, man has discovered a virtually unlimited source of power. He has paid for that power by years of painstaking research and experimentation. That source of power is gasoline, the chief product of the petroleum industry. Gasoline, in fact, is the greatest single source of power in the world today. And the automobile engine is by far the greatest user of gasoline's power. Here's a device that looks like a cross between a trench mortar and an automobile engine. It's just the thing to illustrate the principles of getting power from gasoline. Liquid gasoline contains the power all right, but unaided it can't release the force it holds. When a light is applied to it, 
Liquid gasoline burns as innocently as a wax candle. This proves what we all know. Gasoline has to be mixed with plenty of air to release its power. Then gasoline has more force than an equal amount of gunpowder. Into the first cylinder goes a mixture of air and gasoline. Into the fourth cylinder, an equal weight of gunpowder. When the cylinders are touched off with an electric sparker, the swoosh shows lots of power. When a piston is put into these cylinders, fueled again with gunpowder and a mixture of gasoline and air, a better test of power will show up. The gunpowder has the better of it here, but the gasoline hasn't taken off its wraps. Gasoline does its best work when it's under pressure. In the cylinder, fueled with the mixture of air and gasoline, the piston is pressed down until the mixture is under high pressure. It is clear that the highest pressure kicks the piston the farthest, develops more power. One method of obtaining this added pressure in the automobile engine was to increase the piston stroke. But when carried beyond a certain point, the engine starts to knock. So several other changes were made to increase power without causing a knock. First, the piston top was redesigned so that it will mix the air and the gasoline together more completely. In the latest engines, the roof of the combustion chamber around the intake valve has been lowered just a fraction of an inch. But that was enough so that now the gasoline is mixed with free air and compressed more for more power. Today, the driver of the motor car doesn't get something for nothing, but he does get more power than ever before from the gasoline he buys. Our available supplies of fuel now do more work with increasing efficiency and economy. <laughs> Folks, I've done it. I've discovered the secret of perpetual motion. Yes, sir. Long, long after you and I have departed from this earthly scene, this machine of mine will be working on and on and on and on, never stopping for Sunday, holidays, or bank night. On and on and on and on. Oh, I'll skip it. <laughs>